You know, tonight uh, we are very pleased through the efforts of uh, uh, Bob Wenzel and also uh, with some help from Paul Danik of the Penn Owners Group, you know, we're able to track down these various uh, stars of yesterday and be able to recapture some of the magical moments in what many call the golden era of motorcycling in the 60s and 70s. And tonight I'm pleased to introduce to our speakers the AMA Hall of Famer 1989 well, welcome to the show, Gary Bailey. How you doing, Gary? Hey, I'm doing great, man. Uh, what a pleasure. <laughs> I'm excited. Hey, I'll tell you what. You know, I, I looked over your biography in the AMA, and just so many things stood out. But as always, it seemed like it's the early beginnings that jumpstarts the real motorcyclists that are racing at the highest levels. It seems like it's those early beginnings, whether it's a Hodaka 90 or a Honda 50, or something else. It's always something that gets them going. So tell our listeners a little bit about how you got started in motorcycling. Well, I got started because of my grandfather. Um, his name was Tex Bryant, and he had a motorcycle shop in L.A. actually had about three different shops. Uh, he started out with uh, Indians in the beginning, Indians and harley Davidsons, And uh, when I kind of got a little bit more involved in it when in my younger years, um, he was actually doing uh, uh, matchless uh, motorcycles, and uh, he was one of the first Yamaha dealers in the United States. And that's when they Yamaha had first come out, and the two strokes were kind of coming out, and they come out with that little Yamaha 80 Trail, which I actually uh, took one of those uh, and turned it into a race bike. Because back in the day when I started, like in 1957, everybody was riding like Triumphs. You know, I, was, I started out on a 200 Triumph Cub and, um, you know, everybody was riding basically 200 Cubs and six, 650 Triumphs and, you know, all the big bikes. And then the uh, two strokes kind of come around. So um, that's when I started doing a lot of little flat track and scrambles and stuff. Well, tell us about the early days in racing. You heard my opening monologue that many, many think and feel and believe that the 60s and this early to mid-70s were truly the golden era of motorcycling. So tell us about those early days in racing when you started to make your bones and compete at some of the higher levels. Well, you know, I, I guess the first thing I want to bring up that a lot of people don't even know, in fact, I restored a Yamaha 80 that I used to run short track with, and when I restored it, rather than storing it to its race condition, I restored it to a its actual trail condition because, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s, um, there, were, there were no race bikes. Everything was street bikes, and you basically converted them to go racing with. So, you know, my first bike was, was that I started with basically was this uh, Yamaha 80 um, after I got off of my, my 200 Triumph Cub. And, um, you know, just uh, the change in, in, in going from myself, I went from uh, – doing some desert racing and then I got into a little bit of flat track racing so that I could be a little bit more, you know, local um, with that running Ascot Park and, and a place called Trojan Speedway in Southgate in California. And um, so I, I kind of started with that. And then uh, I heard that there was motocross after I was doing this flat track and, and TT stuff. Uh, I didn't even know what motocross was and uh, come to find out it was the old fashioned scrambles that we used to run even back in the mid fifties. And it was just all natural terrain. And I, I kind of fell in love with that a little bit more than all the short track racing that I did. Um, started racing uh, motocross and um, I, I started out on my 80. And the next thing I know, I had a 100 Hodaka um, and was racing the 100 Hodaka. And I got approached by a gentleman named Nick Nicholson uh, that was the Greaves distributor on the West Coast. Uh, Nick asked me if I wanted to ride for him. In fact, he actually asked me two or three different times because I was winning everything on the 100 class. And um, it was about three months later, and he said, hey, I, I haven't heard from you. And, I, I, and nobody had really ever given me anything or sponsored me with much anything, so I, I, I didn't know exactly what he was asking me to do. Come to find out, he wanted me to just give me a couple bikes and go racing. So I then started riding uh, the, the, the 250 Greaves, um, and then he gave me a 360 Greaves, and I ended up riding three classes every weekend. A um, little different than today, the three classes were basically um, three 20 minute motos in each class. Uh, unlike today, where they have so many classes, there was only a junior and a senior class. 
So basically, I ended up riding uh, three hours of motocross racing, uh, basically with a 30-minute break in between each one because we ran 20 minutes. The juniors ran 15 minutes, and there was a little bit of short break in there. So basically, I was jumping back and forth from one bike to another. Uh, then I got an opportunity uh, to ride uh, for Penton, which was pretty cool, and, and um, got a 125 Penton, started running that class. I, then they come out with a 100, and, and I got a 100 from Penton. And so at some points I was riding a 100 class, the 125 class, the 250 class, and the, the, the open class at that time, which was mostly 360s. Uh, just doing a lot of racing and started racing two and three times a week, running short tracks on Wednesdays and Thursday nights and occasional Elsinore TT. Uh, in one year, I won over 500 trophies. We're not sure exactly how many, but it was over 500 trophies in one year. <laughs> Well, let's hope you stored them all at your parents' house. Then, huh? <laughs> Actually, after a while, I started just... Uh, not even keeping the trophies. In fact, it, because there was no money involved, I, I actually sold the trophies back. I had a deal with each one of the promoters at each one of the tracks, and uh, I sold them back because that was the only way that I could afford to go racing to the next race. Uh, so I sold it back enough to get gas money to to go and do the next race. The trophy was great, but um, you know it was more about being able to go racing. So I, di I didn't have a lot of the trophies. The ones that I had, they accumulated a lot of dust, and <laughs> I just started saving the plaques off of them after a while. You know, that's a very common theme. Uh, you know, we have talked to a lot of guys that uh, are of your ilk, and uh, they said pretty much the same thing. I just wanted to race. Now, let's talk a I am a Pet and Owners Group member. We call ourselves POG members. Okay. And many of the POG members, including Paul Danik, is listening tonight, and this thing will be put up as a podcast and be put on the Penton Owners Group site. So I know that there was an association with the Pentons, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And as we talk about that and your involvement with them, how instrumental at some point were they in maybe getting you to be an instructor and eventually getting to the second question would be the professor part of it. Wow. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I was riding my Hodaka, and uh, Lars Larson, who was uh, associated in New John in the Pentons, um, he had association with them, and when they were coming out with the Penton, he'd ask me if I would be interested in riding the Penton motorcycle. And I said, well, yeah, I would, as a matter of fact. So Lars and I were the two guys basically on the, the, the West Coast that were, were riding the Pentons. Um, and so that's how I kind of ended up with that. And then they come out with the 100 after that. So that was kind of cool. And the cool thing about the Penton when it came out was it was the first real, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it motorcycle, because it didn't have one of the stamp frames like the Yamaha did. Um, it, the Hodaka kind of come along with that, but but I think Penton kind of took it all to to the next level, and made it like full blown motorcycle um, and you know to motocross bike to go racing with, and uh, so that was kind of cool. Um, and then when I was doing the Trans Am series, and uh, it was in Larue, Ohio, in 1969, uh, traveling across the country doing that Trans Am. I had the opportunity to be running, and Pentons were right there in Ohio. And uh, in fact, I believe it was it was either John, or I, I think it was John. It might have been his brother, but one of them had come up, and, and probably the reason I don't remember is so many years ago. But probably because I was about sound asleep when they come and asked me, and they knocked on my door and they said, uh, "Hey, is there any?" possibility that tomorrow that you could uh, do this motocross school and I go what do you mean and they go well a couple of the Europeans were supposed to do a school tomorrow as you probably know and I go yeah and he goes well they decided they didn't want to do it and I was um, well okay um, I don't know what you think about doing a school they said hey look there's gonna be 20 guys here in the morning and we need an instructor okay so if you'll do it I'd appreciate it so that's kind of how it all started, and, and uh, I showed up in the morning, and the guys were there, and I said, hey, guys, um, wow, any chance that uh, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm your instructor, by the way. Um, I know a couple of European guys were supposed to be here, but um, 
I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done a school before. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what I do and best I can tell you why I do it that way. Um, and then I'm going to run through the section a few times and kind of show you. And then I'm going to let you guys go through a couple of runs. Then when I stop you, I'll kind of tell you what I see and kind of give you a little feedback. Um, and of course, at the time, I was one of the top American writers on the West Coast. I was the number one guy at that time. Um, had the number one plate with CMC because there was no AMA back there. So um, I had the number one plate with CMC. And so, you know, it was me on the West Coast and uh, Barry Higgins on the West Coast. So that's kind of how my first uh, motocross school got started. Pentons asked me to do it. Um, it was very successful. Everybody was happy. Uh, and then some people found out about it and asked me about doing another school and one school after another. And the next thing I know, I was doing motocross schools. And that's where the name The Professor came into play. Well, it all started, it started first with a guy named Don Woods, uh, did an article, I believe it was like 72. Um, and I was at a track in Shreveport, Louisiana. And he did an article and he basically started out and entitled it Dr. Bailey's Cure for the European Invasion. Um, that was the title of the article that he did. And uh, from there, somebody else, and, and I don't even know exactly where it ever came from, but somebody started calling me the professor. And the next thing you know, every article that was written was, I was the professor. So um, that's kind of where that all came from. Well, you know... Uh, uh, being an instructor right now, putting an instructor's cap on and telling our listeners, what did it take? Obviously, you had to have a machine that was capable, and there were some out there, but what does it take from a heart and a gut standpoint to be a consistent winner back then? The heart and the gut. You, you basically narrowed it down to what it takes. Um, if you don't have that, you're basically not going to be. Um, you know, you can you can have a great motorcycle and you can want it, and there's all kinds of you know there's there's tons of people out there that say I want it. You know, I want to be I want to be the best. I want to be a Ryan Dungey. Uh, you know, I want to be. You know, I, I I have guys like this all the time, but it's more about your attitude and your heart. And I think back in the day, that's why. I know that's why I was successful. I not only wanted to win, but more than wanting to win, I didn't want to lose. And and I think that that's more, everybody wants to win. It's how do you accept losing? Do, or, or do Can you stand losing? I, I didn't like losing. I, I mean, when your Prius first come over, when I was first racing with Lars Larson and Gunnar Lindstrom, when they first came over here and they were beating me, I, I, I didn't like losing. It, it, the, the winning was great. I didn't like losing. That was the bottom line. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because it wasn't more than two weeks ago I seen one of our managers here and I told him to remember a quote from me. I hate losing more than I like winning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. That's the truth. And you know what that means because, you know, you just know what it means. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I want you to think about it because we're going to take a quick break here. And when I come back, we'll get the answer. But I'd like to know, on when you look back at all of your schools in that, how many national motocross champs have gone through your school, Gary? We'll catch you up in just a few minutes after we pay some bills and come back. Don't forget, the two-wheel Power Hour Motorcycle Show is proudly brought to you by Fairway Ford. All righty, the highway to Axton, Virginia, even better. All right, as we rejoin our interview live from Axton, Virginia, is the AMA Hall of Famer, 1989, Gary Bailey. Gary, when we left off, I asked you, how many national MX champs have gone through your school? Well, you know, you... You gave me too much time to think about that one. <laughs> uh, the number, I, I mean, I can tell you I've done thousands of riders in 45 years. Um, but, you know, what would be my number one student? W would it be wrong to say David Bailey? Um, you know, number one, you know, how, how do you get when your kid is the one that ends up being national champion, um, ends up winning five, six AMA titles, um, just was dominant until he got injured. Um, and, and right. I want to back up real quick to that part right there. And, and I want to say, you ask what it takes to win. 
Uh, when David first rode a motorcycle, which he didn't ride till he was about 10 years old before he decided to start racing. Um, he'd ridden a few times before that, but, um, he was by no means a natural. Um, he had to work hard at it, but what made the difference was his heart and how bad he wanted to win. And so I, I wanted to take that and kind of go back to what you asked me first. Um, but to mention a few, um, Champions are almost made champions or known people. Uh, Travis Pastrana, uh, 12 years with Travis Pastrana. Uh, anybody that follows NASCAR, maybe remember Robbie Gordon and Ricky Rudd uh, that went Oops. to schools. Uh, Je Jeff Stanton, uh, Ezra Lusk, Greg Albertine, Ryan Hughes, uh, Ricky Carmichael, six years uh, with him. Marty Tripe, yeah, yeah. Sebastian Tortelli, David Davy Coombs, uh, Ronnie Tishner, Davy Millsaps, um, Ronnie Feist, uh, Michael Essie, uh, Mike Lafferty, the the the, the off road guy, sure. um, Jessica Patterson, um, uh, wow, Kevin Hines, jeez, uh, I'm just trying to think of. There's so many uh, Zach Osborne, and um, you know. Um, and Jimmy Dakotas and um, and even today, uh, Cooper Webb that I worked with, with for 12 years. Um, and even talking to Ryan Dungey a couple of years ago, he said, yeah, I remember when your bro my brother and I went to your school. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going, oh, my God, that's too funny. Um, you know, there's just so many of them that, you know, it's just it's just hard to remember. And it's just amazing the guys that I run into every day that have been successful at, 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 at even at the level they're at now or mechanics or guys in the industry that say, yeah, I went to your school back then. And it's, just, it's just crazy. You know, that is terrific. It's kind of like uh, uh, just it's like being a coach in any organization at, at the upper levels. When you look at high school or college coaches and how many young men then go out after their careers become pillars in their community, and the first thing they point to besides their mother and father is my coach. My coach got me on the right path, and I, I certainly can appreciate that with you, Gary. One of the things I'd like to ask you about is vintage racing. I was very pleased uh, that uh, I was able to attend and cover the International Six-Day Trials Reunion Ride, the Leroy Winters Reunion Ride, down in, uh, I think it was Logan or MacArthur, Ohio, and was put on by the Athens Motorcycle Club. And me, from a road racing background, I'm more, this is all, like, brand new to me, so I was able to go on the Legends Ride, uh, but my buddy and also the one of the guys that does the segment here, Bob Wentzel, is a high-level competitor in off-road riding, and he competed and won a gold medal in the ISDT reunion ride in his class. So vintage racing in this country is as vibrant and as strong as it was in the 60s and 70s when it was regular racing. I'm wondering, have you ever uh, done any vintage racing? Have you ever decided, hey, I'm going to get the old bike out of the shed, clean her all up, put some gas in her, and then I'm going to head down to one of these cross-country races and throw my hat in it and see what I can do? Um, you know, I, I rode a couple of them. Uh, one of them I was invited to, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, uh, out in California to finish event. I was actually their, their legend for the, for the, for the weekend. Um, mm -hmm. and I rode a Husqvarna out there and that was kind of fun. But the problem for me is, as my knees have become really bad. I mean, I still ride, I still got a, I got a 450 and I got a 250 modern stuff because, they're tall. The problem with all the vintage bikes is first, I'm very tall. Um, and I know I rode them back then and I was still tall, but my knees have gotten so bad that I don't have range of motion, so I can't bend them really well. Um, so it's really difficult to sit on those bikes and be able to ride them. I'll get one on one occasion and kind of, you know, put around on a little bit or take a lap around the track just because I still like to be on a motorcycle and ride, but the actual racing part of it, um, it's just, it's just almost impossible. I mean, we, pres we, uh, promote one of the, um, Arma nationals here at our track right here at Sugar Tree. And, um, that's really a pleasure. The reason I started doing it is because it was vintage and it reminded me of the old days. And, and I guess the, my favorite part of in going to these events and promoting the event here, 
um, is the fact that it, it, it brings me back to the old days. It's the way it used to be. It, everybody's there having fun. They People loan parts to their competitor that they will possibly beat them. Um, you know, it's so different than the way it is today. Today, it's just, it's just way so competitive and, you know, the, the people don't hang out and talk and have a good time and everybody's in their own little pits and locked up in their own little motorhome and stuff. And, you know, to see people come in here and there's so many that come with tents and, and in their vans and the race we just had here a couple of weeks ago at our sure. national was just uh, to see there was a guy that was here that had his van set up with all the tools hanging on the wall. And it was, it was so European, so old school, 60s, early 70s. It was like, oh, my God, that's just, it's, it was awesome. Well, you know, as we get ready to uh, conclude our interview, I have two more questions for you. The first one is, when you look back on your brilliant, glorious career, is there a moment in time that you can say, boy, that was it. That was like the high water mark, maybe of my racing career, or it was in a, something that you did, or, or, you know, was there something that kind of would stand out now as you look back and you'd like to share with us? Uh, I would guess I would have to say two. Um, first, obviously, being the first American to beat the Europeans in motocross on July 4th, 1969, Saddleback Park. Um, Without a doubt, without a doubt, um, a highlight. I mean, you know, there, you, there's only one first, and and I was fortunate somehow. I don't know why God picked me, but just to be able to to be the one to to be that first guy, that was cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably the second one was, uh, and and in that day there was I don't know there was five or six Europeans there, um, and that same year in December, at uh, Westlake Village there was a interim there. Uh, in fact, I actually, was that that was an interim, and um, I there was 21 Europeans, and I got third overall. To me, wow. even though it wasn't anything made of that, to me that was a way bigger accomplishment than beating five or six of those guys at July Fourth race. Um, I mean, when I say that a lot of more top guys were there, so that was a big moment for me. Um, but next to that, there's so many. I wouldn't trade what I did in those days and the way it happened for nothing. It was just absolutely. Um, it's just. It, it's just hard to describe. It's hard to. to nobody would understand. They, they wouldn't understand how great and how how awesome it was to help the opportunity to do what I did to um, to. I don't want to sound bad, but to be as good as I was. Um, and I, I just think that came from hard work because, because I wanted it so bad. And like I said, I didn't like losing. You know, here's, here's a thought. You know, when I think of uh, Ricky Carmichael and Travis Pastriana, I think of, you know, the Xboxes and all the video games and all the, probably the money they're making in that. I think you were born just a little too soon, you know? Well, I'll give you one. First American to beat the Europeans. I have a check. In fact, I have the check in a frame sitting in my in my little museum. I got $150 for beating the Europeans. Is that right? Now, Gary, as we conclude this interview, why don't you tell our listeners, what's Gary doing now? Um, I'm still doing some schools, uh, mostly privates, um, and just working with a few elites, those that, that, that really want it. I'm able to pick and choose. Um, and if I find that they, it, if they don't really want to put out and do what they need to do to, you know, maybe not be national champions, but to really put in a hundred percent, I guess, I, I guess that's all you ever ask for. You know, if they're not willing to put in a hundred percent, then, you know, I, I just don't want to do it. And I'm only working with a few guys each week. Um, just, and just enjoying my life here in Axon, Virginia with my wife and, and uh, just uh, hoping to spend a little more time with her very shortly because I'm just going to do less and less of this. All right, Gary. Uh, if we have any elite listeners out there or they think their sons or daughters are elites and they want to attend or at least talk to you about attending one of your schools, what is the best way to reach you? 
Best way, I'll just give them the phone number and they can go to 434-770-2609 or you can go to mxprofessor at gmail.com and send me an email and I'll be glad to get back with you. You know, it's been my pleasure to take the opportunity to do this uh, look back in time uh, at your racing career. I can't thank enough for you to take the time to come on and answer all the questions that we've had for you. I think it was a brilliant career. You're one of the iconic legends, along with the Pentons and the, 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 the host of others that, uh, that are hopefully still with us today. I really appreciate the time that you spent with us, and I wish you all the best in the future as you go forward, Gary. Well, I thank I thank you very much. I, I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. I, I think one of the biggest things today for me is that uh, that the, 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 those in the sport today, um, I don't think they care enough about history, if they care at all. And I guess it really hit me uh, just about two or three weeks ago when I mentioned somebody about Roger DeCoster, and the guy writer says, "Who's Roger DeCoster?" And I'm going, "Dude, are you kidding me?" You don't know who yeah, Roger yeah. DeCosta is? You, you obviously don't care or love the sport enough if you know nothing about the history of our sport. All right, Gary. I want to thank you again. Those are very valid points. So thank you for keeping the history alive. Gary Bailey, AMA Hall of Famer, 1989. Thanks for stopping by the two-wheel power hour. Thank you, everyone. Keep the wheels pointed down unless it's some gnarly whip. Right on, Gary. <laughs>